Spirit. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I wore, on, wore you on the eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
first visit to Austin. What a joy. Thank you for showing up for my first visit to Austin. <laughs> Dean, Dean Kittredge, thank you for your invitation to be here. When Bishop Curry greeted me last night, he asked me, he said, oh, Chicago and Texas, do you feel like a stranger in a strange land? I said, no, not a bit. Chicago and Texas are exactly the same, <laughs> except for the weather and the foliage and the barbecue, but that's another story. <laughs> Chicago's barbecue is, it's good. <laughs> it's good. I heard a great story. <laughs> a really, really great story I want to share with you. I heard it from the pastor and author Lillian Daniel who pretty much seems to be the person who made spiritual but not religious part of our common vocabulary. The story she told was in a sermon she preached to an ecumenical gathering of church communicators we hosted at the cathedral in Chicago. She told a story about a conference she had recently attended in Amsterdam. It was her first visit there and she wanted very much to take in some of the sights. It was hard, though, she said, to find any local folks who seemed to share her excitement very much. Maybe the Dutch are just kind of stayed, she thought. Where's your favorite place to go, she'd ask again and again. And the answers came back, well, some people like the art museum, or I had a cousin who enjoyed biking the river, that kind of exciting thing. But finally, though, she said she found a local guy who perked right up when she asked. Oh, oh, he said, we have a festival that everyone should see. It has dancing and music and all kinds of wonderful food, he enthused. Great, Lillian thought, at last. Yes, he said, the festival is the greatest thing, but it is over. To a room full of professional church communicators, Lillian held out that story as an image for how we behave too much as church. We are often spending time, energy, and considerable resources answering questions that no one is asking, or at least not asking much anymore. A lot of what we have always done is over. Although we have plenty of challenges, in the diocese I serve in Chicago, I'm thankful to say we have more than a few congregations, agencies, and pastoral care ministries that are not over. 
that do seem to be answering questions people are really asking, and these ministries are bucking the religious decline trend, thriving by several different measures, and they defy easy categorization. I'll tell you about a couple of them. There's a parish in the city awash in incense whose principal mass every Sunday ends with congregational singing of Hail Holy Queen and Throned Above that threatens to take the roof off. That's how we roll in Chicago. <laughs> the place is packed with all sorts and conditions of people who, besides singing over-the-top Marian hymns, band together to meet the needs of folks in prison and on the street. I think of a congregation in a neighborhood not too far away, a couple miles is all, whose Sunday Eucharist involves popping champagne corks at the offertory under fluttering Tibetan prayer flags. The leadership of this congregation is frighteningly young. Its feeding ministry welcomes over 300 guests a week, and at my last visitation there, a young lesbian couple came up to me to say that they decided they were going to stay after only their second visit because they said, no one ever told us you could be Christian like this. <laughs> There's a fierce chaplain at Cook County Hospital who almost single-handedly got the county to reinstate a pastoral care department in the scandalously underfunded public hospital that receives most of the gunshot victims in our wounded city. Or there's the group of folks whose congregation was part of the Diocese of Quincy. Now in what we call our Peoria Deanery, there was an acrimonious split there, and faithful Episcopalians were told to get out of their historic downtown building and not to let the door hit them on the way out. They are now in a rented facility on the college campus in their town and have an impactful ministry focused on students from abroad. At my last visit there, a woman, a lifelong member of the congregation in her 80s, came up to me and said, you know, Bishop, we are so much healthier today than we were saddled with that damn building. <laughs> I could go on. These ministries are not alone. I can describe them, but what I can't give you is some kind of formula that has been the magic key to their vitality. They're all radically different. I've puzzled over it with my staff. What do they have in common? What can we learn from them? And the best, I'm afraid, the best we have been able to come up with is this. Three things stand out. You have to excavate down underneath the surface appearance of each place and get to the heart of the matter. Three things. Number one, each of them is crystal clear about their identity. Within about five minutes of being with them on a Sunday morning at a vestry meeting, feeding homeless guests, praying with teenagers, organizing for gun safety legislation, walking the hospital floors, very quickly you pretty much know what they're about, what they focus on, and it's not themselves. Number one. Number two. Second thing is that these are places and these are people who are having conversations about things that matter. They are not wasting a lot of time on arguments about the color of the napkins. They value and they foster conversations about life and death, serving and challenging injustice, what it might mean to follow Christ in the office on Tuesday morning. And the third thing, I don't know how to measure this. The third thing, and probably the most important thing, is that these ministries, these churches, these individuals have heart. Leaders, ordained and not ordained, leaders at every level are all in. There is engagement. There is confidence in God. There is obvious joy. There's the unmistakable whiff of the gospel, the proclamation at the heart of each of these churches and each of these ministries, the proclamation at their heart is the death-defeating love of God in Jesus. And that is the only answer, isn't it, that will ever really satisfy the questions the world is really asking. I believe 
these congregations and these individual ministers have made their priority the work that Jesus gave to his first friends. They're making disciples. They're helping people to make the worship of God real in their lives. You know, that's the thing about sacraments. Bernard Cook, great Jesuit sacramental theologian, says this. Sacraments don't make true. We don't baptize people so that God will love them. God already loves them. Sacraments don't make true. Sacraments make real. Our task, our delight, what we're here for, is to make the love and endless mercy of God in Christ real. It's already true forever. Now, they're doing that, helping people to make the worship of God real in their lives, helping one another to follow Christ and transforming this world just a little more into the world that God surely wants to see. They're helping people to take up the cross and follow Jesus. The dean made reference to it at Evensong last night. He's brutally honest with James and John. Really? Really? You know what you're asking? You want to sit at my right and let you? Really? A little truth in advertising here. Really? Jesus never lies to us. Jesus Christ never lies to us. And we do not lie to people in church. In holy baptism, we sign them not with a smiley face, (laughs) but with a cross. And we tell them the truth, just as Jesus told his first friends and tells us the truth. This will hurt. This is going to hurt. Living hurts. Anything worthy of the word love contains within itself at least the possibility of some agony. Any parents in the room? Amen? Amen. (laughs) My God. (laughs) This will hurt. The Christian life is one long process of learning to live like this, not like this the way the world does it, but to live more and more into the image and likeness of the one who has made us his own, knowing full well, we've been told the truth, knowing full well that someone might come along and nail us to the wall too, but putting our whole trust in Jesus' promise that this is the only way to real life. These churches, these individuals I've described know the truth and are putting it into practice. What they are not doing is inviting people into an obsessive little religious subculture as if fascinating tidbits about Henry VIII and the colors of the church year were ever going to change anyone's life. (laughs) They are not preaching church, they're preaching Jesus. We gotta stop preaching church. They're preaching not church, they're preaching Jesus. They're presenting Jesus and the vast mystery of his dying and rising. They understand, I believe, that the good news of Jesus, the life-changing, world-changing good news Jesus lived and taught, that becomes a pale shadow when it is reduced to some reports about Jesus. And it becomes even more pallid, scarcely recognizable, when it morphs into an instruction manual on how to perform the institution's secret handshakes. So, what's all this got to do with us? Especially those of us graduating from the premier seminary in the Episcopal Church this morning. (laughs) All right, that was pandering, I admit, but... um, (laughs) What's it got to do with us? Well, here we are. Here you are. Here we are, ready to get out of this joint, to go love and serve Christ by leading the church and serving God's people in all kinds of ways. So as you go, I ask you to join together in listening to the real needs, 
and the real hopes and the real heartaches and the real longings of the world we live in. Listen. Listen and lead. Here are the three things I'm learning and I keep trying to learn from listening to people inside and outside of the church where I live. I'm trying to practice these things. I commend them to you. Number one, help the communities you serve get clear. Focused on what it is you can do more effectively than anyone else to make the good news of Jesus real. Number two, lead in ways that will foster among people conversations about things that matter. Redirect them with love and patience, but redirect them relentlessly from inconsequential church chat. Let there be real conversations that lead to real actions that will really change the real world. And three, give it your heart. Remember what it is you fell in love with in the first place that led you to today and beyond. Or rather, remember who it is who loved you and chose you first. Remember the one who holds you in those wounded hands. Nothing, 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 nothing is more important than that. Then go. I had to say that. (laughs) Go. 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 Take up the cross. Live like this. Oh, my God, live like this. Please, try. Heal the hurts. Bind up the broken hearts and make disciples of everyone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, God has promised to hear the prayers of the church. On this joyous occasion, let us offer thanks and praise, saying, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Hermanos y hermanas, Dios ha prometido escuchar las oraciones de la iglesia. En este acontecimiento jubiloso, ofrezcamos gracias y alabanzas diciendo, Gloria in excelsis Deo. For the church, the community of the baptized, called out for the service of the world. We give you thanks, O God. Por esta nación, por su buen orden, por los en autoridad, y por la esperanza de justicia y paz, te damos gracias, O Dios. For the abundant yearning of creation, ever seeking the harmony for which it is made, we give you thanks, O God. Por la ciudad de Austin, por su belleza natural, su vitalidad y su gente, te damos gracias, oh Dios. For the places we call home, the people we love, and those who love us, we give you thanks, oh God. Por su presencia sanativa y constante con los que sufren. Por los desamparados, los destituidos, los encarcelados, los enfermos, especialmente John Pitzer, los afligidos y los que están solos, te damos gracias, oh Dios. For the grace to take as our own the ministry of Jesus, reconciling, healing, comforting, feeding, and challenging the powers of the world, we give you thanks, oh God. Por su amor ilimitado que perdona nuestros pecados, sana nuestras divisiones y nos libera para vivir en caridad y paz contigo y unos con, o- con otros. Te damos gracias, oh Dios. For those who graduate today, for the gift of these years together, 
and for the strands of love, care, and memory which bind us. We give you thanks, O God. Por los que lo amamos hoy, por su servicio devotado a su evangelio y tu misión en el mundo, te damos gracias, O Dios. For our families and friends, and for the sustaining power of your love made known through them, we give you thanks, O God. For nuestros patrocinadores, los que ofrecen sus dadivas para el bien de este seminario, para tu honor y gloria, te damos gracias, O Dios. For the future, for the work you will give us to do and the people you will give us to love, we give you thanks, O God. Por los que han muerto y por tu promesa que nosotros con ellos resucitaremos con Cristo ha resucitado. Te damos gracias, oh Dios. God, you have committed to your church the ministry of word and sacrament and have established Seminary of the Southwest and the Lutheran Seminary Program in the Southwest to be instruments of your purpose. Endow with every needful discipline of heart and mind all who labor in this place, that knowledge may be increased among us and praise abound. And grant that those who go hence to the ministry of your church may serve you with true faithfulness and wisdom to the honor of your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We will now proceed with the awarding of the honorary degrees. I ask that you please hold your applause until all candidates in each degree program have received their diploma. Doctor of Divinity. Michael Bruce Curry. powerful preacher, chief evangelism officer, presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church. You call the church to change the world through the power of love, to join hands with other Christians, people of other faiths, atheists, agnostics, and seekers who want a different world. You call the church to the hard work of evangelism and reconciliation. The Holy Spirit has done this work before in the Episcopal Church, and it can be done again for a new day. Son of an Episcopal priest, grandson of a Baptist preacher, you grew up in Buffalo, New York. After graduating from Hobart College with honors in religious studies, you went on to earn a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. Ordained in 1978, you served churches in North Carolina, Ohio, and Maryland before being elected bishop in North Carolina in 2000. In 2013, you published Crazy Christians, A Call to Follow Jesus. You write that the church needs crazy Christians who believe that the love of God is greater than all the powers of evil and death that there is a way to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside. You call the church to craziness. You call us to develop, recruit, and engage crazy Christians to join the Jesus movement, to love, give, and forgive like Jesus. In 2015, you published songs my grandma sang. These are the songs that your ancestors, who were former slaves in Alabama and North Carolina, passed down to you. You write, 
Their songs and sayings reflected a deep faith and profound wisdom that taught them how to shout glory while cooking in sorrow's kitchen, as they used to say. In this, there was hidden treasure that they saw many of them through and that is now a spiritual inheritance for those of us who have come after them. You are the first African-American to be elected presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and your landslide election last summer to succeed Catherine Jefford Shorey as presiding bishop was a joyous celebration for the church. When asked by a reporter how you will be different from Bishop Catherine, you answered, our diet. I'm a carnivore. She's not. I eat anything. <laughs> you preached the message of love to our graduates in this sanctuary three years ago while you were Bishop of the Diocese of North Carolina. Your former chaplain while a student at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in the early 70s was in the congregation that day and is today Dean Emeritus Dusty McDonald, whom you credit with influencing you to pursue the priesthood. The Seminary of the Southwest is most honored to welcome you back to Texas with affection and with gratitude for the open-hearted leadership that characterizes your ministry and that promises to be the foundation the church's racial reconciliation and evangelism under your watch. And we are honored to present you with the Doctor of Divinity, Honoris Causa. By the authority vested in me as chair of the board of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Divinity, Honoris Causa. Congratulations. John A. Logan, Jr. 63 years a devoted priest, respected preacher and teacher, carrier of the gospel to the streets, holder of vast knowledge about the church. You have served tirelessly the Episcopal Church in Texas with your keen intellect, extraordinary discipline and organization, and your deep liturgical understanding. You were reared in the Presbyterian Church in LaGrange, Texas, but were drawn to the Episcopal Church by the power, prayer book liturgy while you were a student at the University of Texas in Austin. Following your law school studies completed there when you were 21 years old, you entered Virginia Theological Seminary for your preparation for ministry. Ordained by Bishop John Hines in 1953, you have served All Saints Austin, St. Timothy's Waco, St. Luke's Hospital Houston, Church of the Good Shepherd Austin, and Christ Church Cathedral in Houston, where you were canon pastor, then canon and sub-dean, then acting dean. While you were at the cathedral, you authored the book, Dowered with Gifts, the second quarter of the second century of Christ Church Cathedral. As canon emeritus for the cathedral, where you have given three and a half decades of your life, you continue to fulfill Sunday duties, preaching and teaching. A longtime parishioner at the cathedral recently spoke of your intolerance for politicians' foolishness, which you may vent in a sermon, quote, our regular attendance of late is in anticipation of his vocal reaction to the nonsense of this political season. It's about time for a barn burner. <laughs> you hold the conviction that belief in Jesus requires the church to care for people in need. While you served as canon pastor to the cathedral, you played a key role in founding a ministry that gives 
compassionate direction towards independence to people who are homeless. That ministry, called Compass, continues to transform lives today. Johnny's Walkers, a group you founded more recently, have raised over $85,000 for the AIDS Foundation during the annual AIDS Walk in Houston. Bishop Claude Payne called you to be canon to the ordinary for the Diocese of Texas in 1996, a position you held until you reached the church's mandatory retirement age of 72. However, now as canon emeritus of the diocese, you continue your work as secretary of the diocese, five days a week, eight hours a day, a position you have held since 1986. Canon Logan is an icon of faithfulness, reflects Bishop Dina Harrison. His love for God and for God's church has inspired generations of Episcopalians to greater faith and service, and his devotion to the Diocese of Texas and its history has enriched our common life in countless ways. In recognition of the many outstanding contributions you have made to the church and the Diocese of Texas, Seminary of the Southwest is honored to bestow upon you the degree of Doctor of Divinity, honoris causa. By the authority vested in me as chair of the board of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Divinity, honoris causa. I'm gonna hug him, everybody. <laughs> Bertha Sadler Means, educator, businesswoman, civil rights leader. You see the best in others and refuse to contribute less than your very best self to any endeavor. You are an inspiration to your accomplished family, the Austin community, your alma mater, Houston Tillotson College, and your church, St. James Episcopal Church, where you and your late husband are founding members. Working in cotton fields during the Depression didn't keep you from winning a scholarship to college and earning degrees in English and education. You taught at Blackshear Elementary, Keeling Junior High, and Allen Junior High. You earned a master's degree in education from the University of Texas at Austin. You retired from the Austin Independent School District after a long teaching career. In 2002, the school district awarded you the W. Charles Aikens African American Heritage Award for your character, leadership, and community service. Austin's Young Women's Leadership Academy bears your name. Michael Barnes' 2013 feature, Six Generations of Courage and Vision from an Austin Family for the Austin American Statesman's Ancestral Austin series, tells the story of your family's successful efforts through persistence, hard work, and confidence to rid Austin of the last remnants of Jim Crow segregation. When your children were not allowed to skate at the Ice Palace rink on the same day that you were denied access to a driving range on Burnett Road, your anger moved you to organize. A life of discrimination and determination to change the world for your children fired your resolve, and change happened. You and your husband James, a member of the mathematics faculty of what is now Houston Tillotson University, organized, picketed, and stayed the course toward the end of segregated education in Austin. You integrated the teacher's credit union. Your daughter Patricia was the first African American to graduate from St. Stephen's Episcopal School. Your son, James Jr., is the first African-American to letter in UT Athletics.
Your daughter Joan fought to desegregate Barton Springs and Zilker Park after not being allowed to swim to attend her high school senior picnic. Since 1984, you have owned and run Austin Cab Company. You have served the Houston Tillotson Board of Trustees, the Human Relations Commission, Austin Parks Commission, the NAACP, the Urban League, Alpha Kappa Alpha, and the Austin chapter of Jack and Jill of America, a family organization for African American mothers. When you and a small group of Episcopalians were not welcomed in Austin's white Episcopal churches in the early 1940s, you reached out to the Diocese of Texas to found St. James, which is now a large multicultural community. Bertha Means is a force of nature, says your friend, Judge Laura Livingston. One minute she is leading the charge concerning an issue of civic importance, and the next minute she is organize a black tie, organizing a black tie event for visiting dignitaries. She is admired and adored by the people she has mentored, and she continues to teach and lead by example. For your vision and courage, for your leadership and tremendous accomplishments, and for your dedication to education and civil rights, we are honored to bestow upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. The authority vested in me as chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. Will the candidates for the Diploma in Anglican Studies please rise? Madam Chair, the following candidates have completed all requirements satisfactorily and have earned the Diploma in Anglican Studies. Power vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest I confer upon these persons the Diploma in Anglican Studies. Mary Louise Keenan. John M. Pitzer in absentia. Will the candidate for the Diploma in Theological Studies please rise? Madam Chair, the following candidate has completed all requirements satisfactorily and has earned the Diploma in Theological Studies. John Kent Berry. By the power vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I confer upon you the Diploma in Theological Studies. Daniel Haldeman in absentia. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Religion please rise? 
Madam Chair, I present to you these persons who, having completed all requirements satisfactorily, have earned the degree of Master of Arts in Religion. By the power vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I confer upon these persons the degree of Master of Arts in Religion. Walter J. Bazzini IV. Arlen Thomas Farley. <laughs> David William Peters. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Counseling please rise? Madam Chair, I present these persons who, having completed all requirements satisfactorily, have earned the degree of Master of Arts in Counseling. At the authority vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Counseling. Andrew Ryan David. Tracy Ann James. <laughs> Vanessa Pauline Nearing. Cindy G. Noland, in absentia. <laughs> Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Chaplaincy and Pastoral Care please rise? <clears throat> Madam Chair, I present these persons who, having completed all requirements satisfactorily, have earned the degree of Master of Arts in Chaplaincy and Pastoral Care. By the authority vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Chaplaincy and Pastoral Care. Sherry Goodwin Bannock. Meredith Macy Boyd. Congratulations. Thank you, Bishop. Francis A. Stell. Congratulations to you. Well done. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation please rise? Madam Chair, I present these persons who, having completed all requirements satisfactorily, have earned the degree of Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation. The authority vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Spiritual Formation. Rebecca Smith Hall. <clears throat> Sh 
Cheryl Lynn Teeter. Congratulations. James Elroy Whitworth. Congratulations to you. Well done. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity please rise? Madam Chair, I present these persons who, having completed all requirements satisfactorily, have earned the degree of Master of Divinity. Uh, the authority vested in me as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Seminary of the Southwest, I now confer upon you the degree of Master of Divinity. Justin Andrew Boyd. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Leisha Diaz Brannon. Congratulations. Andrew Duncan Ellison. R. Scott Painter. Yay! Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Christian Raybone. Jennifer Lynn Shadel. Thomas Temperley. Well done. Thank you. I'd like to ask all the candidates to stand one last time, the graduates, that is, and let's make a little uh, noise to celebrate here. It's always a joy to gather as the seminary community in all its many manifestations around the globe. And to have us gathered today is a great blessing and a great joy. Uh, I want to introduce to you uh, the Reverend Christian Hawley, who is the Associate Rector of our host church, St. Matthew's, and he has some information for us. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Bishop Harrison. It's, uh, it's a joy to be here. I sat as a, a graduate there three years ago and listened to, to Bishop Curry, so it's a, a moment of joy and hope to, to sit here again and, and welcome you all to St. Matthew's. So on behalf of Merrill Wade, our rector, our vestry, our parish, who many of which are sitting in the balcony today, uh, it's, a, it's a joy to, to have you with us. Uh, after the service, uh, we invite you to come out onto the piazza. 
that's our fancy name for the courtyard just to the, to the south of here, for, for the reception, for the graduates, for all our distinguished guests and, and friends of, uh, of the seminary. So we invite you to come out and, and join us there. If you have any questions, look for the folks with the St. Matthew's name tags on, and we'll be happy to point you to the, to the bathroom or show you around the memorial garden for pictures. So again, it's a joy to, to host this every year, and yeah, we're, we're glad to celebrate with you all. Thanks. I would call to your attention that the offering today is designated for Episcopal Relief and Development, especially their work with Syrian refugees. So please uh, make checks payable to the Seminary of the Southwest, and I invite your generosity. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. things come of you, O Lord, and of your own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
Because in Jesus Christ our Lord, you have received us as your sons and daughters, made us citizens of your kingdom, and given us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in your in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Remos como nuestro Salvador Cristo nos enseñó. Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venga tu reino. Agase tu voluntad, en la tierra como en el cielo. Ana doy de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas, como también 
Sotros Perdonas a los que nos venden, no dos que caer en tensión, y libranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, tuyo es el poder, y tuya es la gloria, ahora y siempre. Amen. of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks.